Hello, we're reading Where the Mountain Meets the Moon by Grace Lynn, with permission from Little Brown and Company Publishers. We are on Chapter 9. Underneath the moon shadows of the trees, Ma stumbled with weariness. Ba did not know how long they had been walking. With every step he peered at the ground, the light flickering as the lantern swayed in his hand. The forest was full of shapes and shadows, and only barely could he see the faint foot footprints on the ground. It was like searching for a wrinkle in a flower petal. As Ma tripped, he steadied her with his arm. We should rest, Ba said. Ma shook her head and pulled away angrily. We must keep going. We have to find Min Lee. But you are tired, Ba said, and I am too. We can rest, and afterward we will be able to continue faster. I am not tired, Ma said fiercely. Her irritation seemed to give her energy. If you are tired, you can rest, but I will continue to look for our daughter. We should stay together, Ba said quietly. If you wish to stay with me, Ma said, then you will have to keep going. Ba sighed and took out another candle. The light from the lamp, lamp kept away the forest animals, but it could do nothing for Ma's fury. Her resentment seemed to darken with the fading moon. But as they walked, the morning bloomed in the distance. Its light slowly filtered over Ma and Ba through the veil of tree branches, so he could finally blow out the candle in his lantern. He looked at Ma and could see that her bitterness was only sharper in the softening sky. If Min Lee stopped to rest, Ba said, we may catch up with her soon. When we find her, Ma said, she must know that she is never to do this again, never. Now, wife, Ba said, Min Lee did not leave to cause us harm. No, Ma said, her words cracking the air around her. She left to find a fairy tale, never ending mountain and the old man of the moon of all the foolish things. Stories are not foolish, Ba said again in his quiet way. Says you, Ma said, because you are the one who filled her with them, making her believe she could change our miserable fortune with an impossible story, ridiculous. Yes, Ba said sadly, it is impossible, but it is not ridiculous. Ma opened her mouth again, but stopped, for up ahead there was a noise of breaking branches. It was the sound of someone pushing through the forest. Ma and Ba looked at each other. Min Lee, Ma said. Forgetting their fatigue and frustration, Ma and Ba began to run through the woods. Ma ignored the branches that scratched her, and Ba let his hat fall to the ground as they rushed toward the unseen person. Min Lee, they called, Min Lee. But as they burst upon the figure ahead, they stopped in shock. It was not Min Lee. Instead, Ma and Ba stared open-mouthed at the goldfish man. Chapter 10 Min Lee gaped at the dragon in front of her. He was brilliant red, the color of a lucky lantern with emerald green whiskers, horns, and a dull stone-colored ball like the moon on his head. At least what Minley could see of him looked like that, because he was also half covered by ropes of twine that had been tied tightly around him, so he couldn't move, and by the silvery lake of water his tears had formed all around him. Minley had always thought it would be thrilling but scary to meet a dragon. Her father's stories always made them sound so wise and powerful and grand. But here was a dragon before her, tied up and crying. Minley didn't feel awed by it at all. In fact, she felt rather sorry for it. Can you help me? The dragon sniffled. I am trapped. Minley shook herself and started swimming toward the dragon. What happened to you? She asked. The monkeys tied me up while I was sleeping, the dragon said. 
I have been here for days. Minley swam over to the dragon and climbed onto his back to get out of the water. There she opened her pack, took out the small, sharp knife she had brought with her, and started cutting the twine. Why did the monkeys tie you up? Minley asked. Because I want to go farther into the forest to the peach grove, the dragon said, and the monkeys will not let anyone through. I have been trying to make them let me pass peacefully for days, but they are so unreasonable. Finally, I told them if they did not let me through, I would just force my way. They know I am big and strong enough to go through without their permission. So when I went to sleep, they tied me up. Why won't the monkeys let anyone pass? Minley asked. Because they are greedy things, the dragon said. They have just discovered the peach trees that make up the next part of the forest. The monkeys do not want to let anyone through because they do not want to share the peaches. Even when I promised not to touch any of the fruit, they would not let me through. They do not even want to share the sight of those peaches. Why do you have to go through the forest? Minley asked. Can't you just fly over? More tears, the size of lychee nuts, rolled down the dragon's face. I cannot fly, he sobbed. I do not know why. All the other dragons can fly, but I cannot. I wish I knew why. Don't cry, Minley said, patting the dragon, feeling more sorry for it than ever. I'm going to Never Ending Mountain to see the old man of the moon and ask him how to change my family's fortune. You can come too and ask him how to fly. You know where Never Ending Mountain is? The dragon asked. I thought to see the old man of the moon was impossible. You must be very wise to know how to find him. Not really, Minley said. I got the directions from a goldfish. Chapter 11 It took a long time for Minli to cut all the twine that bound the dragon. For some knots she had to swim underwater and cut through the waving grasses. As she popped in and out of the water, cutting, she told the dragon all about her village, the goldfish, and how she had just started her journey. I'm Min Lee, she said to the dragon. What's your name? Name? the dragon asked slowly. I do not think I have a name. Everyone has a name, Minley said. When you were born, didn't someone give you a name? When I was born, the dragon asked, thinking hard. Yes, Minley said, again thinking that this dragon was very different from any dragon she had ever heard about. What did they call you when you were born? The Story of the Dragon when I was born, I remember two voices speaking. Master, one voice said, this is magnificent. The dragon is almost alive. Add more water to the inkstone, another voice said. This voice was near my head. I felt the warm air of his breath. And speak quietly. You will wake the dragon. I am sorry, master, the first voice said in a more subdued tone. It is only that this painting is most amazing, even for such a skilled artist as you. This dragon painting will bring great honor to the village when we present it to the magistrate. Wasted on the magistrate, the master said under his breath, so softly that only I could hear. A conceited, self-important man who, when only the imperial family is allowed to use the image of a dragon, commissions one. Now that his son has married the king's daughter, Magistrate Tiger will do anything to flaunt his power and overstretch his authority. But this painting will buy his favor and free the village from his unfair taxes. What, master? the apprentice said. Nothing, the master said. Only that I have painted this dragon on the ground, not flying in the sky like all other dragons. Perhaps the magistrate will see how his wealth weighs him down. 
I doubt the magistrate will understand that meaning, master, the apprentice said. True, the master said, but the dragon should still please him. I will prepare for his visit. The painting is finished. Clean the brushes and take great care with my special inkstone. It is one of a kind, the only inkstone that was able to be made from a rock my master cut from a mountain far from here. He never told anyone which mountain, so we can never make another. Yes, master, the apprentice said. But the dragon, yes, the master said. Is it finished? The apprentice asked. You have not painted the eyes. As a painting, it is finished, the master said. Young apprentice, I still have much to teach you. And I heard the voices and footsteps fade away. It was a strange feeling. I felt the warm light of the sun running over my skin but my arms and legs were frozen. I could hear the wind rustling leaves in the trees and birds hopping on the ground, but I saw nothing. Time passed. I only knew because the air grew colder. I heard footsteps coming toward me, many of them, so I knew it was a whole procession of people. As you requested, your magnificence, a voice said, I recognize it as the master's. May I present this, which I humbly painted in tribute to the great magistrate's rule. There was a silence as all gazed, I supposed, at me. Painter Chen, another voice said in great awe, this is indeed a great work. Thank you, magistrate, the master said. I am glad it pleases you. Then our agreement will be fulfilled? Yes, said the voice, the village will be free from taxation for the next year, and I will take the painting. Even though I did not know exactly what was going on, I knew I did not want to belong to Magistrate Tiger. His voice had an undertone of cruelty and greed, even while he was expressing his pleasure. I tried to protest, but my still lips uttered no sound. Then I was rolled up, and all sound and feeling disappeared. I did not know how long I was rolled up. It might have been a day, or a month, or a year. All I could do was wait. But finally I was unrolled, and I felt a cold gust of air all over me. If I could have, I would have shivered. This painting is a masterpiece, a voice said in surprise. Then it quickly turned oily and flattering as only fitting for your greatness. Yes, Magistrate Tiger said, have it hung behind my chair. Yes, Magistrate, the voice said, and then hesitated and said, how strange. What strange, the Magistrate asked. Well, the voice said, there are no eyes on this dragon. The painter must have forgotten. No eyes, the Magistrate boomed. Painter Chen dared give me an unfinished painting. I will double tax his village for the next ten years. Magistrate, a third voice said, one that seemed a little kinder. It is only a minor flaw. If we just dotted in the eyes, the dragon would be finished. Mm, yes, the magistrate said, obviously considering. Bring me a paintbrush and ink. I heard the servant shuffling and bringing the paintbrush and ink. I felt the magistrate's hot, dry breath on my nose as he came close to me, and I felt the cold ink touch my eye, and suddenly I could see. I saw the magistrate's fat face leering over me as he reached over and dotted in my other eye. We have to stop this recording or we're going to run out of time. We're right there. <laughs>